Market to Market is everywhere you are. Subscribe to Market to Market on YouTube, find us on the PBS video app to stream on demand, and add our three podcasts on your favorite podcasting app. This is the Friday, June 4, 2021 version of the Market Plus segment. Joining us now, John Roach, Senior Market Analyst. And John, uh, in the South, if you look at the drought monitor this week, which comes out every Thursday, it, it, we pay attention a lot to that during the growing season here in North America. We see to the north it's dry, but to the south it is hard to find any dry conditions, and that's specific in cotton country. Is too much moisture causing a problem and, pour, and pushing cotton higher? I think that we're um, seeing uh, too much moisture in some spots, and they may be doing a little bit that may be uh, maybe helping the cotton market. But we just have a bullish situation going right now in crop markets in general, and um, uh, and remember that much of it's coming from demand from China, uh, and China is also a, a, a buyer of cotton too. So uh, all the markets seem to be operating somewhat in a uniform positive nature because of the uncertainty of weather and because of the size of the demand. Okay, I'm going to take the inverse now of the, the too much, and let's go to less water. And Jenny in Des Moines is asking us, how does the prospect of a failed wheat harvest affect how Midwest corn farmers should think about marketing their 2021 crop? I'm not sure that, um, uh, that you want to look at spring wheat and think how that impacts corn. Uh, the problem with spring wheat is that it's a relatively small crop, uh, and uh, and the the real competition comes from winter wheat, uh, which is a which is a cheaper priced uh, feed stuff. Uh, and this year, particularly with all the moisture that they have down through uh, winter wheat country, uh, that crop is actually looking pretty optimistic. And we anticipate there will be some of that wheat that's fed uh, to livestock uh, uh, because of the price comparison uh, and uh, because of the availability. And so uh, we think wheat could cause corn a little problem. Uh, we wouldn't look at wheat from a standpoint of shortage there, positive corn. We'd flip it around. More wheat than what we probably need, negative to corn, at least at this juncture. Okay. Uh, so then let's ask about the soybean side of this same discussion. And this is Husker Fast in Lincoln, Nebraska, who's asking us this question. Are we out of soybeans if the Dakotas dry up? Now you get to play speculator. Are $20 soybeans coming if that's the case? Uh, $20 soybeans are pretty high prices. Uh, remember, it's a wholesale product. Uh, you have to be able to uh, turn it into a meal and oil, and then somebody has to buy that meal and feed it, and somebody has to buy the oil, and, and from what it looks like, we're going to put that into uh, uh, some sort of a renewable fuel. And so uh, uh, it's possible uh, that we could have an energy market strong enough to do that, and, and we could have... Uh, uh, livestock uh, uh, prices strong enough to, to do that, but uh, I wouldn't be betting that way. Uh, what I would be betting right now is you're liable to get a sell signal on beans next week, and that would be a good opportunity to be getting sales made on soybeans. That's that's what our plan is. Uh, uh, we think putting any beans at this price level into a bin this fall doesn't make any sense. Um, it just takes too much uh, uh, to make that profitable, and there's just a lot of risk involved in doing that. And so uh, uh, we'd, be, uh, we'd be careful here for a little bit to not get distracted off of our game. If you're going to let weather and spring wheat country and the Dakotas take you off your game of getting sales made in Iowa and Illinois and other areas where you have good crops, uh, th that would be a mistake in my opinion. All right. You've already kind of teased a little bit of this question, but Marilyn Johnston, Iowa, is asking kind of some of what you just answered. Uh, what should a producer be doing with new crop? How would you utilize option values in this crazy marketing year? Okay, there's, that's a great question. Now, what I'd be doing is I'd be trying to take risk off the table. I take risk off the table depending on where you are, 
basis is the first issue. Basis in a lot of areas is much better than normal. So a cash contract at the elevator represents probably the best sale opportunity, particularly in maybe the case of corn. A new crop sale right out of the field or, or for the delivery period that's best for you, as long as you don't go too far down the road because there's no carry in the market. Uh, so uh, uh, that's the first crop to deal with. The crop you can't store, that all needs to get sold. The crop that you would like to store, uh, you have storage for it, or you're afraid to sell it, or you're really optimistic, you see something out there the rest of us are missing, uh, and you'd say, look, I, I, I don't want to sell this percentage of my crop. Excellent. Go consider, at least, buying puts to put a, a floor underneath that crop and so that that way you can count on what you've sold plus the floors you've put to get yourself in a financial position that makes sense on your farm. The flip side of that on options is say, well, look, these cash prices are good enough. I don't care about uh, 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 insuring the, them from declining because my bet is they probably will. So what I'd rather do is I'd rather sell the crop and then I'll go buy a call option just in case this weather thing turns out to be a real problem. So there's two ways of using the options. One is to insure while maintaining the inventory. The other is to sell the inventory and then go buy some price insurance in case prices go up. For most farmers, if you get the crop sold and it represents the profit level on the farm that you've projected, you then could take some of that and go buy some call options and put your ownership in Chicago and change your risk structure. And that makes a good sense for most all farmers to walk through a discussion with somebody who's knowledgeable on their operation and their storage and their ability to handle grain and their profitability and so forth and come up with a very specific plan. And that's what we've really been doing all week and we'll be continuing to do is we'll be formulating plans for farmers who are trying to figure out how do I get my way out of here without leaving a lot on the table. And uh, that's what we've been uh, spending a lot of time doing, and, and the options help us do that. All right, I'm going to go. I'm going to keep on the marketing theme here for a minute, and uh, I'm going to go to Tim in Crookston, Minnesota, who had a question. Kind of, you just said something that made me think that this is maybe where we should go next. It seems that the past couple of weeks of trading has basically managed money, trading technical signals more than fundamentals. How will we know when the market returns to trading fundamental data over technical signals? Another good question. Uh, it swaps back and forth. Um, uh, let me give you an example in corn here for just a second. I don't have my numbers in front of me here, but it seems to me that the spec funds own 400,000 contracts of corn uh, when the market uh, was peaking back here a month or so ago. Uh, then uh, the prices started to decline. And once they started to decline uh, and, and, and moved into downtrends, for fundamental reasons. The fundamental reason was we got the crops planted here and we got some precip in South America and we stabilized that crop a little bit. And so we started down for fundamental reasons. And then once those trends changed, then we got the spec funds and they came in and they sold 130,000 contracts, six in my mind. If you want to multiply 130,000 contracts times 5,000 bushels of contract, you'll find out that that's bigger than the Chinese ever are. So the spec funds took it away from the fundamental traders. Okay, now this week we flipped back around and the spec funds bought 20,000 contracts of corn prior to, during the week ended Tuesday. And that, again, 20,000 contracts multiply it out. That's a lot of grain. And so we pushed prices back up above the green line. We think the green line 20 day moving average. Uh, you probably don't know it as a green line, but it's a 20 day moving average. Mm -hmm. We mark it green. So you always know when you get the green light. When you go up through the green light, you turn that spec fund back into a buyer. So the fundamentals move prices back and forth, but once the price starts to move, it triggers technical indicators and that activates the big boys. And, and we have to remember that when prices turn down, the big boys are owning big inventories right now. And if they start to sell them, 
you won't see it on the weather forecast. You won't see it in the Chinese news. It's only going to happen in the pits or well, in the, in the computer. In the computer pit, the yeah. Lab, in the computer matching. And, and, and those spec funds will go from being long, a near record quantity to probably being short, a near record quantity before it's all done. And you want to be the seller when the spec funds are the big owners. You can't wait until they're the big net shorts, because at that point, the market will have already moved a long distance. Okay, um, Phil, thank you for your question. I, I want to move to a, a little global picture. Phil was asking about June sales and the next weather option, but this one's a little more. You mentioned China, and we, it's something we're always watching. And uh, Minda is asking us via Twitter, uh, wondering what the smart folks in ag make of China's info war. I know that we should watch what they do and not what they say, but any other wisdom, but do you have any other wisdom to offer about reading the Chinese tea leaves? You just got done talking about computers, large positions, large move, market movers. China's that same way. What's the China tea leaves telling you, John Roach? <laughs> um, they're confusing. Um, you know, the situation right now be, uh, between uh, the United States and China is, is getting dicey. And, um, uh, and so it's hard to know what the, what, really what the tea leaves uh, bring. But, but what do we know today? W what we know today is, is China grew its hog population large enough that now the prices are going down. And so, although we thought it might take a long time for them to get their hog herd back large enough to, it didn't, it didn't. Uh, and, um, uh, and so now uh, we've, we've gone through a period here of heavy demand for feed grain to feed livestock. Not only did you have the other poultry or the, the, the other proteins, you also had the hog industry growing and their demand grew because of that. But, but now farmers are losing money. So look for maybe some contraction in China because of they're not making any money. And mm -hmm. so that could maybe slow their demand. Let me make this suggestion. We were talking before about the, the spec funds and the Chinese, and I compared in corn that the spec funds in the last couple of weeks have been bigger, maybe I should say last six weeks, have been bigger than the Chinese. So I think if you would like to learn more about the people who are bigger than the Chinese, that might move you further ahead in your marketing than trying to figure out what the Chinese are going to do. The big spec funds are reliable with what they do. They go into the marketplace to make money. They follow the old adage, the trend is your friend. And if you want to watch what they do over time, it will help your marketing. We have, a, we have four boxes that we pay attention to. What the fourth and most important box, our key market indicator, is the money flow, which is the position of the spec funds. China does not have a box in our key market indicator. <laughs> I'll tell you what. They, uh, so my, compar my comparison is to between the two, China doesn't have a box. So, so it's hard to try to understand what people are going to do in China. It's easy to understand what the funds are going to do. They're going to stay with the trend. And we like that you've stayed with us over the years as our senior market <laughs> analyst. You. John Roach, thank you so much. All right, next week, we are going to look at, some of the, look at some of the monumental impacts on Western stakeholders, and Sue Martin will join us to break down the markets. Thank you so very much for watching, listening, or reading This Market Plus. Have a great week.